So my name is Vasile Stanescu. Uh, I am an associate professor at Mercer University in the Department of Communication and Theater. I'm also the chair of the department. I also edit a book series, the Critical Animal Studies book series that's published by Rodopi and Brill. Uh, my areas of research are only related to animals and veganism. We call it something called critical animal studies, um, but it's just animal studies in a way that's supposed to really impact people and bridge the divide between the academy and activist. That's my goal. So I have about 25 peer-reviewed publications that are all on the issue of animals, veganism, locavorism, humane meat, cr uh, critique of Temple Grandin, uh, and now in vitro meat. Uh, so that's my background. Thanks for joining us. So I guess up until this point, I interviewed Paul Shapiro on my channel, the author of Clean Meat, where he introduced me to the lab-grown meat industry, where up until this point, it's really um, my perception of it is this is a way to deliver actual real hamburgers, real chicken, real fish to the billions of people who never go vegan without harming animals. So this way they either take a feather from the chicken, they grow the meat in the lab, or they use some type of um, DNA code from a database to make all these things. And I think the pr presumption is that most people will, like 8 billion people, most of them will not shift their habits. And this is a solution to help uh, counter animal agriculture and shift to more vegan world. So um, that's my perception until this point that I talked to Dr. Ralph from Climate Healers and he suggests I speak with you because up until this point, I'm only on one side. I have all the information here and I haven't heard the counter arguments or what potential problems are with this industry. So if you wanna start going into, I guess, maybe the different problems, list them one by one, the study behind it and all the information you wanna present. Absolutely. So the first problem I have, and the most important problem I have with in vitro meat is that it is not vegan. Uh, it's not vegan in at least one way, as you say, the cells come from animals and they do have to keep the animals and they do have to harvest new cells later on. So it's not that there is somehow no need for animals, but it's also not vegan because of the growth medium. So the primary growth medium that's used in in vitro meat is something called FBS. That stands for fetal bovine serum. So what is fetal bovine serum? When a pregnant cow uh, comes to slaughter, they uh, kill the cow and they take the fetus out. The fetus is fully aware uh, outside of the womb without any anesthesia. They do a cardiac puncture and they pump the blood out of the heart. That blood out of the uh, fetus's heart is what is fetal bovine serum. Uh, and the amount of fetal bovine serum they need for the experimentation, just the experimentation that they're doing for uh, in vitro meat is massive. Let me give you a few numbers. A bovine fetus at three months yields about 150 milliliters of FBS. At six months, 350 milliliters. At nine months, so that's a term, and that's what they try to do. They try to kill the... Uh, uh, cow and harvest the fetus as late as possible because they want as much FBS, it's still only 550 milliliters. Currently, they need 500,000 liters each year. That's just for the research of uh, in vitro meat and cell cultures. So right now, that's the market. So that seems to me grossly unethical and grossly unvegan. Now, some people, to be fair, some people will say, well, they're working on uh, slaughter-free alternatives to FBS, and they absolutely are. And some companies, so that example, Just Food or Memphis Meats have made pronouncements saying we're making progress or we're there or we're having breakthroughs. The problem is all of them say that these are industry secrets. So they won't tell us uh, what the new growth mediums are, uh, how they got there, uh, when they'll be scalable. All we have are pronouncements from uh, startups. And so I can't help but be a little skeptical about how it all might work out. 
And for me, even if one day it does work out, I think it's so grossly enough to go right now that I can't understand why any vegan would support it. So let me explain that part. In vitro meat also represents animal experimentation on a mass scale. So as a vegan, I won't use say shampoo that's been tested on animals, even if there are no animal products in the shampoo. Uh, other people won't use cosmetics that have been tested on animals, even if there are no animal products in the cosmetics. We believe that if something is produced by mass animal suffering, that product is inherently not vegan, even if somehow they don't have to use those animal products anymore. So even if, and I have my doubts, but even if one day they figure out a growth medium that doesn't rely on FBS or some other animal byproduct, for me, in vitro meat would still be intrinsically not vegan, like that shampoo or like that cosmetic, since it was produced by mass animal suffering. About 2 million uh, bovine fetuses are raised and killed each year just to produce the FBS. Just the experimentation is grossly unethical, even separate from what product they ever get to. That's what's happening now. The other problem I have with uh, in vitro meat, even if one day they have a breakthrough, is that it violates the animal's rights to consent. So Peter Singer famously wrote Animal Liberation. He's a utilitarian. I'm not a utilitarian. Carol Adams gives a talk and she says, okay, how many of you read Animal Liberation and it convinced you to be, and we all start to raise our hand. So we think she's about to say vegetarian. And then she says utilitarian. And we all put our hands back. Because in fact, most of us aren't utilitarians. If we did experimentation on humans, we could make mass progress that arguably could help decrease suffering for all the humans we didn't experiment on. We can make mass progress on AIDS research or mass progress on Alzheimer's. Clearly experimenting on humans could arguably have massive utilitarian benefits. And one could argue that the benefits in terms of health or lack of suffering are more important than the suffering we cause on that group of humans. So if that is true, why would almost no one recommend doing that? And at least part of that answer is because those humans don't consent to that treatment. There are no humans that say, please experiment on me to develop your AIDS research for someone else. So too, since we're doing 2 million <laughs> animals a year for experimentation, none of those animals are consenting to this treatment. So we cannot decide for them what we think is in their best interest. That is the worst kind of allyship. It is the worst kind of anthropocentrism when we think we're smarter than other animals. We, we're the good caretaker of the animal world. That's always been the problem. We should listen to what the animals actually want, freedom to be with each other out of their cages and then support them. We shouldn't be telling them what to do, torturing them, and then deluding ourselves that that's a good thing because we've decided utilitarianly that the good at the end is going to outweigh the mass suffering we're causing right now. So even if they later figure out a way to make a growth medium that doesn't use the blood of unborn cows, I do not think that it is vegan to support in vitro meat. Well, that's great points. I did understand all the research behind it. I just hear take a chicken feather, put a little thing there, a little biopsy. And the way you describe it is, is there the math behind the numbers? You said there's 500 milliliters and you need a certain amount of hundreds of thousands of animals that were tested on? Yeah, so 550 at nine months, which is the maximum, 550 milliliters. Uh, the current market for research of in vitro meat and uh, cell-based uh, animal agriculture is approximately half a million liters, not milliliters. And so the current estimate is around 2 million uh, fetuses that are processed each year. Oh, wow. And then I think before discussing this, for people to understand, there's, you said veganism is not, should not be seen as a diet or it's more of a lifestyle. Do you want to go more into that, what we talked about before this call? Absolutely. So I think the number one way 
in which the animal liberation movement led itself astray is by articulating veganism as a diet, as a consumerist life choice, personified in the phrase, vote with your dollars. Uh, for me, it is not. So many social justice movements have a boycott aspect to it. Uh, I'm in no way comparing uh, different types of uh, oppression that people and, and uh, animals go through. That's not what I mean at all. But we can look at other ones and go, okay, there was a great boycott to help migrant workers. So many other social justice movements will say boycott this industry or this product because of this social justice idea we believe in. We think migrant workers are people and deserve rights. Grape uh, producers are treating them poorly. Don't eat grapes. Many other examples. So too, animal liberation has a boycott aspect. We don't uh, buy meat, we don't buy animal products, we don't go to zoos, we don't go to circuses, we don't consume leather, et cetera. But the point is in fact, never the boycott. The point is social justice issue of animal liberation. That's what we really care about. And what has happened is a social justice issue activism has now been supplanted by consumerism and greenwashing and voting with our dollars. And I'm highly skeptical that this consumerist option, this individualistic consumerist option will ever produce much in the way of true gain for animals. Definitely, and also my transition to veganism when I viewed it as a diet in the beginning, like that tricks humans for my health as well, where as I always heard vegan diets are healthier, vegan diets are healthier. I was eating French fries, I was eating the processed vegan foods, and then I went to a doctor, like your triglycerides are really dangerously high, your cholesterol is high. Um, and then I spoke to Dr. Esselstyn about his research and he says vegans and vegetarians, they get, I guess, treated for heart disease all the time. So he recommends whole food plant-based is the diet when they talk about health in the plant-based health community. And he said he doesn't use the word vegan in his book. So it's, it's never been more crystal clear than that, that it's the movement about the animals and then the diet is completely separate where that's something I wish I realized personally from my own health perspective at the very beginning. One of the things that concerns me is, uh, it seems to me there's a steady attempt to depoliticize animal liberation. So, I mean, you hardly even hear the phrase animal liberation. And then we're told not to even say vegan, we're supposed to say vegetarian, and then we're not even supposed to say vegetarian. We're supposed to say plant-based, and instead of plant-based, we're supposed to say plant-strong, whatever that even means. And so somehow the argument seems to be, if we just stop talking about animals, we'll achieve animal liberation for animals. I have no idea how this idea it, it, it could possibly work. I, I can't think of any other social justice movement where the winning strategy was not to talk about what we really cared about and to talk about something else entirely different. Um, I'm not a vegan for health reasons at all. I mean, I'm a vegan for health reasons in the sense of the health of the chicken, but not my individual health. I think it's great that there are health benefits, but if tomorrow, I learned there were no health benefits to being vegan that wouldn't make the slightest difference to me. It is important that people can be vegan and be fully healthy. We can't ask people to be unhealthy. But other than that, I don't care about health. That's not the purpose for me. It, it is not a diet that I'm doing, like, I don't know, low carb or keto or something like this. It is social justice because I think what we do to animals is horrible. That's why I'm vegan. That's what I should be fighting for. I have no idea how in vitro meat helps that happen. Great points. And um, in the vegan community, we always hear vegan for, well, vegan for health, vegan for animals, vegan for the environment, where like you, you said it clearly, the animals come first. When it comes to the environmental side of things with uh, the lab grown meat, are there other, in comparison to other types of diet, or, I use the word diet, see how it's ingrained in my mind. So um, are there an, any environmental aspects that are less than ideal from that industry? Absolutely, fantastic question. So the first claim that proponents of in vitro meat will give will be like decrease animal suffering. We just talked through why those claims are skeptical. The second claim will be is like better for the environment. So for example, there was a uh, news report that came out in Bloomberg in 2013, and I'll just read two quotes to give you the idea of what we all hear. Quote, a University of Oxford study of cultured meat 
estimated a 90% savings on resources, including feed, water, land, waste disposal, and greenhouse gas emissions over the massive environmental cost of animal husbandry. Well, that sounds very convincing. What Bloomberg did not tell you is that this was from one study that was commissioned by New Harvest. New Harvest is a nonprofit dedicated to promoting lab-grown meat and funded by the in vitro meat industry. The person who conducted the student was a graduate student, so not a Oxford student in any sort of the normal, uh, Oxford study in any sort of the normal sense of that term. Not to say that graduate students can't do great work, but when you hear that, you might think it was like a, a group of high-level PhDs at Oxford all working on it, but it was one graduate student that New Harvest hired to do the study, and they did it in the way to generate the most bias. I mean, of course, uh, academics have to get funding for our research, but this is how New Harvest did it. They said, hey, everyone, send us your proposals of how you're going to figure out if in vitro meat is good or bad, and then we'll select those proposals of all of them. And then obviously they chose the one that was the most biased towards their own industry. So unsurprisingly, the study has all kinds of problems. It did no actual experimentation whatsoever. It was based on a series of thought experiments, and the thought experiments were based on a series of technologies which no one uses in the in vitro meat industry, do not currently exist, and there's no peer-reviewed evidence to show could ever exist in the future. To give one example among many, they assume that all in vitro meat would use as a growth medium, not FBS, but a type of algae, even though no one uses that algae currently. So unsurprisingly, there are no, zero, no other peer-reviewed studies that have found that in vitro meat is sustainable. And there is a growing number of studies, peer-reviewed studies, which have found that in vitro meat is worse for climate change than even factory farms. I'll read you one quotation. Quote, cultivation of in vitro meat requires more industrial energy produced by burning fossil fuels than pork, poultry, and maybe even beef. So why would in vitro meat be worse for climate change than even CAFOs, factory farms? The reason is while they use less land, so there's less habitat loss, less trees being destroyed, which is great, and less water, absolutely, to make in vitro meat is the single most resource intensive technique in all of modern biology. So they just have to use massive amounts of electricity. And if you think about it, it actually is very logical. They have to not only produce the meat, but they have to make muscle. So they have to create elaborate meat gyms to stretch the meat out all the time to produce the muscle. We say meat, like what is meat? It's actually muscle to produce the meat for you to eat. So to create huge vats to cultivate all this meat and to do these huge elaborate meat gyms actually uses more electricity, more fossil fuels than even CAFOs. So it is completely not sustainable. We are in a crisis for the environment, which will help hurt both us and other animals. And it is a waste of time to be focused on an industry where all of our current peer review data says is probably worse for the environment than even the current CAFO system. Wow. And I guess that leads to my next question with 8 billion people in the world growing at 10 billion, the majority of the world is eating a meat-based diet. And how do you suggest people shift their behavior from a meat diet to vegan, whole food, plant-based or whatever um, it is? Right. Excellent question. So I think we should take a step back because what you'll see all this time is they will say decreases in meat consumption are somehow fanciful or utopian. What's realistic is in vitro meat. How can cloning, who, when told that they need to stop the suffering of animals, comes up with the only possible solution is the cloning of animals in huge vats? Margaret Atwood literally includes this example to show what a dystopia would look like. She calls it chicken knobs. It's not that no one has imagined this before, just most people thought that sounds appalling. I mean, is the most utopian, fanciful idea one could come up with. And you're exactly right, we don't have much time. So we do not have time to be wasting on a technology that no one knows if it will ever make it to market. No one knows what the growth medium will be. 
No one knows if it's scalable. No one knows if you can somehow get around this huge amount of electricity or if consumers will even want it or not be grossed out by it. What we actually have to do in a short period of time is make political demands, laws, legislation to uh, de-incentivize meat and to shift people's diet quickly. There's not really another option. I mean, we're working at, as you may well know, a five to 10 year window for both climate change and mass species extinction. If we do not decrease, the UN says, the Paris Climate Accord says, we do not decrease global consumption of meat by 50%, we're not gonna make any of the Paris Climate Accords ingredients, you can't do it. So fanciful long-term technology solutions, while the proponents pretend they're more realistic, they're actually more fanciful and utopian. To decrease meat consumption, nothing has to be invented. No technology needs to be developed. All we need is the political will to actually make it happen. Absolutely. And there's people I interview on my channel, if people are tuning in for the first time, I interviewed David Simon, he's the author of Metonomics, where he talks about the government subsidies. Laura Reese from Agriculture Fairness Alliance, she is helping shift government subsidies away from uh, meat industry to plant-based agriculture. And I interviewed, um, was it Emma Hurst from the Animal Justice Party in Sydney, Australia. So if you're interested in learning more about the political side of things after this video is done, check that out. Um, when it comes to people who are, let's say, they're already vegan or, you know, let's start with that first. People are already vegan and they eat, let's say, whole foods plant-based, vegan diet, whatever it is. What could they do to help us reach those goals of transitioning the world? Absolutely. So first let me say three people you just mentioned, uh, big fans. One of the reasons I came on, I love their work and those arguments. Those are exactly the right kind of arguments to make as well as other organizations like Nation Rising in Canada that are working on similar goals. So the first answer would be work on those goals. One of the main ones that you just hit is the subsidies that the government gives to the meat and dairy industry. Many people do not know in the United States, the dairy industry is already a zombie industry. It loses money every single year. If you just had a pure laissez-faire capitalist system, the dairy industry would already be bankrupt. So why do we have a dairy industry? Because the US government replaces dollar for dollar to the tune of something like $39 billion directly and indirectly every penny the dairy industry loses. So when you read Peter Singer's Animal Liberation, it makes no collective political demands. The only thing you or I are supposed to do is somehow individually go vegan and then convince a couple of other people to do the same. I call it the multi-level marketing view of veganism. I go vegan, I convince two people to go vegan, they convince two people to go vegan, somehow the whole world goes vegan. I can think of no other social justice movement that works that way. I can't think of somebody who ended homophobia by convincing two people to be not homophobic, who convinced two people. Every other social justice movement has had a political demand. Yes, we want to change people's minds. Yes, we have boycotts that we do, but also, we have a political demand that we are making. We need, as a movement, multiple political demands. And one of the great ones would be to end subsidies. One that I personally feel quite passionately about, passing laws to give animals the right of consent and refusal in terms of sex and mating. Uh, if this was enacted in law, tomorrow it would end most animal agriculture since virtually all animal agriculture uh, engages in gross amounts of sexual assault of all of the animals. And you could do that at a state level. You could do that on ballot initiatives around the country. And you could watch as the meat industry has to run ads explaining to people why sexual assault of animals is necessary for the industry to exist at all. But my point isn't this suggestion or that suggestion. My point is, we have to think collectively. 80 billion animals aren't killed because of a few bad people. That is work of many people in many places all around the world. You ever heard the term, the personal is political? We actually say it backwards. It was coined in terms of feminism. And what it meant was there are no personal solutions to the situations that women were experiencing. Childcare, 
not getting paid time off. There can only be political solutions to solve personal problems. Incredibly, we flip it and say our personal action is creating a political solution. I don't think that's true. If we want to change things for animals in a short period of time, we need political solutions to solve the personal problem we have of being vegan in this world. Absolutely, I'm with you 100%, whether it's the political change, then also just some of my other interviews with the documentary, I would really like to focus on other systems level changes as well, where I got approached by someone who viewed that same trailer as you did, where she felt inspired saying, the, why are the meals in hospitals not plant-based, not vegan? It just makes Absolutely. no sense. And she's starting an initiative to help shift the menus in those. So I gave her contacts at some of the hospitals I spoke, uh, some hospitals I know people at. She's contacting them and starting the work done. There's people in the university system and every area of society, there's different types of systems that people can change. And in my opinion, political, educational system, hospital system, even how we raise children in the educational system, there's so many systems that can be changed and that's how we make wide scale change in addition to just one-on-one -on -one outreach. I love what you're saying. I mean, my partner and I lived in Oakland, California and for many years and where we lived was a food desert. Uh, and so there were no uh, grocery stores and there were no restaurants. Uh, there were several liquor stores and you would see mothers trying to buy like bread and uh, milk at these liquor stores. And there was a big sign paid for by the government that said, eat five a day, uh, fresh fruit and vegetables. But there was no way if they did not own a car that anyone around us could get a fruit or vegetable. Mm -hmm. So what is the point of telling these people they need to be vegan when there are structural issues that disincentivize it and make it impossible? And why should I feel superior when I take out Grubhub, not that I use Grubhub, but theoretically, and I choose the vegan option instead of the non-vegan option, and they bring the food to my house? These are clearly completely different phenomenons. So if we want a vegan world, we have to deal with structural speciesism. We have to deal with the walls and the history and the things that are in place that make it hard and difficult for people to go vegan, that make it more expensive for them to go vegan, and that literally pay the industry dollar for dollar for every single one of our boycotts. If the boycott industry idea alone would work, we would have already won at least in terms of the dairy industry, and made huge progress in terms of the meat industry. The reason we're not is because we don't have a political force, we don't have political pressure, and they replace it dollar for dollar. Absolutely. I remember reading an article here in Australia where like people weren't buying cow's milk and supermarkets had to throw it away because in mass <laughs> quantities, yet right. the government still puts the money in and subsidizes it. So it's not a loss. In, where... in the school system in the United States, they, they pay for uh, milk for the children. There's high rates of lactose intolerance for uh, many uh, students of color. They come to school every day, they eat the lunch, they get sick, they don't learn well, they come back the next day. I mean, it's dietary racism funded uh, by the government. And so why is the government buying massive amounts of milk to put in schools? Yeah, exactly. So these are the sort of bigger political questions that I think we have to grapple with. Definitely. Are there any other problems with the lab grown meat industry you want to talk about in this interview or any final thoughts to sum things up or other places people could go? Sure. I, I will just highlight that consumerism is not a great method for social change. Now, I actually am, <laughs> have no problem with, I'm supportive of the various uh, plant-based alternatives, impossible meat, beyond meat, et cetera. But the research we have, even about that, shows that it has not really changed numbers to any great degree. And it's very difficult to find uh, good evidence that consumerism alone is going to achieve uh, much. Uh, let me give you a few examples. The example that uh, proponents of in vitro meat give, they'll say, hey, look, we used to have horses and then we invented the combustible engine and now all the suffering from horses is gone. That's the example that people like Peter Singer or Bruce Friedrich give as the analogy to prove why in vitro meat will be exactly the same. We used to eat all this meat, we're gonna have an apolitical technological innovation and that's gonna stop the suffering. But what we actually find obviously is massive amounts of horses still suffer, millions around the world are still owned. So in fact, the car didn't end, the ownership 
and mistreatment of horses. And obviously the combustible engine, cars, is causing mass suffering of animals way worse than it was even when uh, there were just horse-drawn carriages, climate change, roadkill, disruption migration patterns. So the analogy they give is actually the exactly the correct analogy. In vitro meat both won't end the suffering of animals and by being less sustainable, by making climate change worse than even factory farms, it'll actually make the problem worse, not better. If anyone else wants to follow up on any of this, uh, academia.edu, so just the word academia.edu, uh, under my name, I post all of my research. So there's about, I say about 25 articles there now. All of the talks, uh, podcasts, everything is there. And so, and it, uh, all free, and I encourage people to go and just look through all of it. And, and people want to get like two sides. There's a public debate I did at UC Berkeley um, about in vitro meat. And so there are two people in favor of in vitro meat. And I was with another colleague against in vitro meat. And you can watch the whole debate. And then you can just decide yourself based on both sides. But I would just urge, look, we have all been tricked once before. Every vegan who wasn't born vegan realizes that they were misled. The industry wasn't their friend. And they've seen through that change. So please keep that skepticism and find out what is really going on with in vitro meat before people make large public pronouncements for an industry that isn't even at market.